he will lift you up. And we lift up our voices this evening to praise our God, the mighty God, by singing from Psalm 147, the B version, and we sing these stanzas one to four, and the tune is Irish number 101. Psalm 147, B, one to four, praise ye the Lord, for it is good praise to our God to sing, for it is pleasant, and to praise it is a comely thing. And we know God is the one who will build up Jerusalem. He is the one who gathers his people to himself. Those who are grieved, broken, he heals. He counts the number of the stars. He knows all about us. He knows the whole universe as his uh, place. Psalm 147, we stand and sing praise. One to four, the tune is Irish, 101. Let us praise God together. Praise ye the Lord, for it is good. Praise to our God to sing, for it is pleasant and to praise. It is a comely thing. God. Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we worship you. We praise and exalt your name, for there is none like you. You count the very number of the stars. You know them, and you know all the people of the earth. You know us individually, and you know our needs, O God. And we thank you that you are the one who gathers your people into your church, that you will be exalted and magnified. And so, Father, we pray today that you will continue with us and direct our hearts this evening to your great name, and that we would come again to learn about Jesus Christ and all that he has done for us and how we ought to follow him. And so, Lord God, be in our midst. Stir up our hearts as we hear your word read and as we consider it together. For we ask in Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen. (coughs) Please turn with me in God's word uh, to the prophet Isaiah. We're reading familiar words from Isaiah chapter 52 uh, at verse 13 and through into chapter 53. Isaiah beginning to read in chapter 52 at verse 13, and we'll read through into chapter 53. Isaiah 
at chapter 52 at verse 13. Let us hear God's word. Isaiah 52, 13. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness, so will he sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand." Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Amen. We pray that God will bless the reading of his word. <clears throat> this evening, as we come to matters for prayer, we're going to be focusing on the land of Estonia. We've been working our way uh, through Europe, and we come to Estonia, uh, this country there with the Russian border, Latvia to the south. What do we know about Estonia? Well, I confess knowing pretty little about it. Some statistics, first of all. Uh, it is, uh, the capital is Tallinn. The population of Estonia is 1,325,188. <coughs> so uh, just uh, slightly over a million and a quarter people. Uh, the population under 15 years is 16.5%. Official languages, Estonian uh, and Russian, is still also a common language. Uh, <coughs> Christianity uh, boasts 45.3%, but the largest religion, as you will note, is 54%. Some matters for our prayers. Estonia found political 
and economic success after the time of Soviet dom domination from 1940 to 1988, poverty remains a problem and greed for material possessions grows as the economy grows. Estonia faces a crisis of values as the people become more and more secular in their attitudes. Pray for a wise and upright government to model righteousness and biblical values. <clears throat> On regard to religious, religious freedom is an open door to Christianity, but also to theological error. Many marginal Christian sects are increasing in number and influence. Mormons have more missionaries in Estonia than any Christian agency there. While actual pra practitioners are few, a recent poll showed 11% of Estonians expressed warmest feelings towards pre-Christian pagan religions. Pray for the truth and light of Christ to be established in this new marketplace for religious opinions. And despite a Protestant heritage, uh, genuine faith is rare. Many have limited Christian belief. Uh, very few follow Jesus in a meaningful way. Most of the population need to be evangelized. So that's our great need to pray for Estonia. Pray first of all for the political sphere, for good government, but then importantly for the need for uh, not only uh, uh, witness, but for the church, for those who are faithful to Jesus to grow and pray for Christian witness to Estonia, a country maybe we don't think much about, at least certainly I don't, so remember them. We continue this evening to remember the need in our land for government, pray for those who are putting themselves forward again as prime minister and do remember the government in our need. And also another matter we can remember in our prayers uh, just remember the work in Nantes uh, in France. Pray for the littles. Pray for the building work that is uh, ongoing and just for strength and energy uh, in Nantes for the fellowship there at this time. Continue to pray that sinners will hear the gospel in our own town and that we will hear of people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. So with these matters before us, let us come before God let us pray. <clears throat> o Lord our God, as we uh, take and view the land of Estonia this evening, we bring it to you, to you with our prayer, O God, that you will work in this country. We thank you that it has uh, had some economic success after being under the dominion of the Soviet uh, nations, and we pray for this land, O oh God, that they might have a faithful government and be able to manage their affairs. But we recognize, O oh God, that they need, above all, the preaching of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in all its truth. As we read these prayer points, we're aware that there are those who are bringing error and false religion to a people who may be even open to receiving something to seek to satisfy their spiritual need. And so, Lord, we cry out to you that you will bring and send mission workers into Estonia, that there will be faithful work done to bring the name of Jesus Christ to the fore and to proclaim him as the only way of true life. We pray, O oh God, for the population that you would work in their midst, and we pray that you might make the Bible available to them, that they would read it to their soul's good, and that they might seek to learn of you. We thank you where there are faithful, godly, Christ-serving people. But Lord, we know that they may feel very much in the minority in that society. Build them up in their faith. May they be conscious of you and aware of your goodness and mercy. And may they see the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ grow. Gracious God, we pray that you will build a witness for the glory of your name. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we commit this land to you, we continue to pray that you will just give blessing in 
the work of your kingdom in other places. We remember the ministry of our church in Nantes, and we pray for the littles there as they labor, particularly as they will have to deal with practical building work on their doorstep. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will give energy and strength and ability to Andrew to handle all the calls upon his time, and may he continue to be able to faithfully preach your word, to pastor your people. And we pray that the group there who meet together as a fellowship of your people will know much of your grace and your goodness and care. Lift up the light of your countenance upon them, O God, and may they be blessed of you. Gracious God, we know the great need there is in France uh, in general, and we would pray that you will be pleased to call people to faith in yourself. And Father, we recognize that is a great need in our own land, and not least in our own district. And gracious God, we come to you recognizing our weakness and that we are utterly dependent upon you, O God, in mercy to work in the lives of men and women and to challenge them and to bring them to know that you are God. So, Father, we pray that it will please you through the witness of your people in our community, through the preaching of your word, through the Bible that is in the hands of so many, that people will respond that you, O God, would stir life into the dead, that they might come to know Jesus Christ as Lord. Father, be merciful to us as a community, indeed as a nation, and in your goodness and in your mercy, O God, we pray that you will bring into the place of prime minister and government someone of your choice, the one who will be able to lead and direct with firmness and fairness and justice. Lord, we would pray that you will bring stability to our land again. We would ask, O oh God, that you will just overrule. Father, we recognize the great need for the Bible to be the building block, the, the bedrock of government, and yet we grieve that it is so often ignored. So, Lord, we cry out to you that your will be done. Gracious God, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers, O God, too, for those known to us who are laid aside in weakness. Again, we commit them to you for healing and restoration. We would ask, O God, that your will be done and that you would lift up the light of your countenance. Indeed, as we bow before you, meet us at the point of our need, O God, each one of us, that we might praise the Lord and magnify his name. For we ask it all through Jesus Christ and for his glory. Amen. <clears throat> Let us turn again to the word of God. We're turning to the passage we're going to be thinking about in Matthew chapter 20. We turn to Matthew and to chapter 20, and we're going to read from verse 17. Turning in the Word of God to Matthew and to chapter 20, reading from verse 17, let us hear God's Word. Matthew chapter 20 at verse 17. This is the Word of God. Now as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and, kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? 
we can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And then at verse 28, we pray that God will indeed bless to us the reading of his word. Before we come to this message, let us again sing praise. We turn to Psalm 71. Psalm 71, we're singing stanzas 1 to 5, and the tune is Consolation, number 66. The psalmist says, In you, O Lord, I refuge take. Ashamed, let me not be. O oh, save me. In your righteousness, give ear and rescue me. Here's the man looking to God for rescue, for help. But he knows the Lord is his rock, his strength. He knows he's the one he can come to and find much blessing. Indeed, he knows that he will be sustained of the Lord and has been sustained of God. So he is ready to praise the Lord, as he says in stanza four, endlessly. Psalm 71, 1 to 5, the tune is number 66, Consolation. Let us praise God together. In you, O Lord, I refuge take, a shame let me not be. evening we're going to be looking at these verses we've read from Matthew chapter 20 verses 17 to 28 and we could say and I'm calling this a lesson on following uh, because I think it's really that's what all these two parts are really about. It may not be true to say that absolutely everybody 
as a kind of lust for power. Some of us would shy away from that, and yet it is in our hearts that we would all prefer to be those who are looking down on others. We would prefer to be those who are honored, uh, especially if we think that that's going to free us from some of the menial tasks and hassles of life. We would rather be an authority over others than be the slave of others or the servants of others. Of course, it has to do with our makeup and whatever particular personality type you may be. But I suspect that most men and women in their fallen nature prefer not to be at the bottom of the pile, but rather to be somewhere higher up and have others below them. That, of course, is as a result of our sin. In our sin, we think better of ourselves than we ought, and we think we deserve more than we do. We have an inflated opinion of ourselves. We think that we are worthy of some better position or authority. And all of those things come, of course, as a consequence of our flawed understanding of the fact that we uh, need to view ourselves more in the light of the glory and holiness of God and see our sin and how far we have fallen from him. But in Matthew chapter 20, in these verses from verse 12, I think we have this lesson on following, and it begins with Jesus speaking about the path that he is going to follow, or will have to follow. And remember, he is on his way to the cross, and he shows us that path. Then we have the incident where this mother asks for positions of authority in favor of her sons. And then Jesus has to answer her by speaking uh, or to his disciples of the true place of the follower. Where will his followers really be? So we're thinking, first of all, of the path of Christ. As we read it here, Jesus is speaking uh, about himself and what he has to face up to. He talks about what lies ahead for him. He is, of course, on his way to Jerusalem. And he wants, and I suppose he's trying to help the disciples to understand that in Jerusalem it's not going to be easy. He wants to help them to understand what lies ahead so that they might be prepared for that day time when he is taken and crucified. And yet they, in their lack of understanding, cannot fully appreciate what he is saying. To them, Jesus is going to Jerusalem, and they are so earthly bound. And, and we needn't criticize them in a sense, because if we had been with Jesus, we could not have begun to appreciate that he would have to suffer and die because we have, with the disciples, we would have watched him do miraculous deeds. We have seen him uh, heal people from many sicknesses and traumas. We have heard and not noted how he raised he people from the dead. We, with many others, would have listened to his teaching and been delighted to hear the message that he brought. And so for, for the disciples, for us, if we had been there, to think of him going and being crucified, mocked, and so on, it just doesn't add up. But Jesus is trying to prepare his followers as to what will happen. And we should note here, as we think about what Jesus says, as he talks about what's happened, he knows exactly what is going to happen. He knew exactly what lay ahead of him. He was aware of the prophets, and he knew that Isaiah and the others spoke of him and the trauma that awaited him. And so when he speaks about uh, being betrayed, he knows how that's going to come about. When he speaks about uh, the condemned to death and being mocked, and flogged and crucified, he knows exactly 
the road that he is on and all that lies ahead of him. And yet here is the faithful servant, son of the living God. Is he going to back out from this? Not at all. Here, even here, he has set his face toward Jerusalem, toward, if you like, the cross. And uh, as we follow him coming nearer and nearer the cross, so the pressure becomes greater and greater. But here is the Lord Jesus, willing, willing to obey the Father, even though he knows the trauma and the difficulty that is coming. That fact in itself is surely a lesson for us today if we would be followers of Christ. We must be prepared, even though it may mean difficulty and trial, to follow our Lord and Savior and to do his will. We may anticipate, we cannot know like Jesus knew, but we may anticipate that following Jesus is going to bring us to a place where we're finding it difficult, where the world is opposed to us. But we need to learn a lesson from Jesus. We are to follow as he followed, uh, uh, as he did the will of his Father. We note as Jesus speaks of these things, he calls himself the Son of Man. He was the Son of Man, yes, He was fully man, but he was also the son of God. He had been born of Mary. He grew up as a child, and like every other man, he looked like a man. And that's another reason why the disciples just couldn't understand why such a good man would ever have to go the way of the cross. But he talks here about what he would have to go through, his path. Because that is the only way that he could deal with sin. And that's why he came. He came to deal with man's greatest problem, to bear the penalty of sin. And only he, only the God-man, could take the wrath of God on the cross and bear that punishment and give his righteousness to clothe those who would look to him. So Jesus speaks about being betrayed to the chief priests, condemned to death. And in verse 10, he shows us that he'd be handed over to the Gentiles, that is, to the Romans, to suffer on the cross, flogged, mocked, crucified. And he's telling his friends, the disciples, be prepared. And he adds in the hope and the comfort at the end. And he will be raised to life. He will be raised to life. What the disciples understood of that, we don't know. Did they understand it at all? Perhaps not at this stage. Later, after the resurrection, they were reflected all of these wonderful things and they would say, he knew. Remember what he told us how he would die and be raised to life. We might not have understood. We might have overlooked the fact that he said he would suffer and die and be raised to life. But what an advantage we have today because we don't uh, stand with the apostles, but we stand in our position in history looking back at what has been accomplished. Jesus Christ did take this path. He was handed over to the Gentiles. He was mocked and flogged and crucified. And remarkably and most remarkably of all, on the third day, he rose to life. He came back again to show that he had conquered the enemy and defeated the foe. Jesus didn't shun this act of service. He humbled himself even to the cross. Not for him a triumphant battle in the world, 
on a mighty steed with sword flashing and shield defeating his foes. No, rather, the pit of suffering, the stigma of the criminal, the blood shed on the cross. What a lesson in the sacrifice of Christ to how we should be prepared to follow him. He bore all of that for the sinner who comes to him and rests upon him alone for salvation. He was handed over to the hands of the Gentiles for us Gentiles that we might through him have life. What a wonderful thing Jesus did for us. He was the true servant giving all and yet winning the greatest of all victories. But then secondly, in this portion, we want to note the passion of the disciples. It is the mother who comes and asks the favor of Jesus. Perhaps the two sons have put her up to this. It reminds us of how Adonijah in 1 Kings sent his mother into, Dave, into Solomon to see if, if he could get a Bishag to be his wife. He using someone whom they thought would have influence. And here, these two sons, James and John, come uh, through their mother and ask this of Jesus. And what was it? It was in their hearts. What did they desire? Well, we read of it. Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. They had grasped something about kingdom, but I think they're still thinking about ruling over people on the earth. They're thinking that Jesus is going to get rid of the Romans and that the Jews are going to set up a nation and they want to be the prime minister and the chancellor of the exchequer at his right and left of the king. James and John want the best position. That was the passion in their hearts. Not to be menial servants, but rather to be leaders, to be those who'd be honored, those who would walk through the streets and people would, would bow down to them and applaud them. And we ought not to be overcritical without thinking about how we might react in those circumstances. And if we look at how the other disciples reacted, we might learn for ourselves. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Why do you think they were indignant? Did they look at them and say, you, you should have been servants, you shouldn't have been asking for that position? I don't think so. Their indignation was, why are you asking? What about us? We, have, we would have the same right to those positions. The passion in their hearts would have been, we want to be part of the cabinet. We want to be those who will rule over. For all of us, as I said at the start, would have that desire to be ruling over others where we might have an easier life in one sense than to be those who are mere servants, unnoticed, unthanked, and perhaps completely forgotten. The passion of the disciples was to be leaders and rulers. And the indigna indignation of the ten simply proves that they too were like the other two. And that's the heart of many people today, thinking about how we will rule over others rather than be those who would be servants. What is the passion in your heart or in mine? Are we ready to be servant-hearted, to be doing the will of God? As Jesus has speaks of his suffering and dying on the cross, that should have spoken to these disciples. But they're still thinking, in earthly terms. Today, people do put themselves forward, as we know, 
for leadership. There are many people who would prefer to be rulers than workers at the bottom of the pile. It's something goes against the grain for us when we're told to get on with the menial task, to do that thankless task and that task that is never noticed. But what a lesson from the passion of these disciples. We have the great advantage of knowing we have a servant saviour. And that should speak to your heart and mine. As we view this incident, we note how Jesus speaks to the sons. He says to them, Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? Again, they have no true understanding, but they will understand in time. They immediately answer, Yes, we can drink it. But Jesus knows what's going to happen to them. They are unaware of the depths and the pains and the sufferings that that will entail. Jesus then has to give the answer, these two positions, they're not mine to give. They're not mine to give. They belong to the Father for the one who, for whom they have been prepared. Jesus is saying to these men, just take note. Think about what you're asking for. These positions, they're outside what I can give to you. You ought to be thinking about how you can serve. And there's a lesson in it for us. If we think we have a position in the kingdom of heaven, let's be mindful that we are in the position of a servant for that's what he goes on to speak about. That, in fact, is the place of following that we come to thirdly in this passage. Jesus speaks here about the place of following. As he goes on to instruct these disciples, he takes this opportunity to teach them a real lesson. He called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. He says, you look at the world and you can see, and, and you're acting like them. You can see, and this would have rung a bell. The Romans were lording it over uh, the, the, the Jews at this point. They were in authority, the Gentiles. And the people knew that there were many who were burdened by the Roman rule. It was something that was very patent and obvious to them. And Jesus points them and says, you're, you're wanting to be like them. That's the way they are. You know how the rulers get on and the authority they have. But he says to them, you need to be different. Not so with you. What is the place of the follower of the Savior Jesus Christ? Is it to be lording it over? No. He says, here is where you're to do. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. He's saying to the disciples, are you prepared to do the ordinary everyday things? to serve one another, reminds us of Jesus and how he was to wash their feet. The most menial task. He sent to them, and he did say to them that you should wash one another's feet. That's the servant attitude. Something that people would find detestable. You're to do for the glory of God. If you would be great, then service is the watchword, and he has already spoken about the path he is on. It's the path of service, the way of life. Does that strike you in your heart? Have you perhaps lobbied for position or tried to be the one who is noticed rather than simply working the works 
of service. Yes, there are those who need and by God's calling are put into the position where they are noticed, where they have to be to the front and leaders. But what a joy it is to see servant hearts, even in those people. They're not there because that's what they delight and joy doing to be in the limelight, but rather because that's what God has put upon them, called them to do. And there are others who quietly get on with serving, speaking a word here and there, doing the practical tasks that nobody else even notices. And they do it with a whole heart because they believe that's what God wants them to do, to honor his name. Not so you, he says. You're not all going to be lording it over. If you want to be great, rather, just get on with the everyday speaking to people. Encourage the unbeliever. Speak to the downcast Christian. Lift them up by a few words. Do some practical good deed for them. And in this way, demonstrate the love of Christ. Fill a shoebox and send it off to the other side of the world. Nobody may know but be a servant of the living God and you will be the first. And Jesus refers to it then uh, and it's speaking really of what we've already noted uh, in verse 16, a repeat of the last verse of the previous chapter. So the last will be first and the first will be last. The person that the world often writes off because they're just doing small tasks Where do they come first? In the sight of God, they are the ones who are worthy to be exalted and will find much blessing from him. As we think about our place in the kingdom of God, it is surely following Christ on the path of servanthood, following him even whenever that service is difficult and hard being prepared to suffer with him for the glory of his name. And that's what Jesus is telling these people to do. You are to be servants. What an opportunity he had to teach these disciples at this point. They'd still so much to learn. And as we follow them into Jerusalem, into the garden of Gethsemane and to the cross, we note how they still had so much to learn. But when the risen Lord came, they knew what to do. Be faithful servants of him who told us the path he would follow, the path of mockery and suffering, death and resurrection life. In a way, the clincher to the argument of Jesus comes in verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's what Jesus says to them. Just as I have come, he says, not to be served, but to serve. So you are to serve others and serve one another. That's the attitude we need today in the kingdom of God. It's the attitude we need in the church. If the church of Jesus Christ is to prosper, we need those who would serve. Are you prepared to be a servant, to enter wholeheartedly and follow Christ wherever he leads you? There may be trauma. There may be difficulties. But service is where we are best fitted to follow the master. In some countries today, they do serve in the face of trauma and beatings and imprisonment and even death because they know that in Jesus Christ, they have the refuge and strength that will never let them down. And in him is life indeed. And they are not prepared to let go of that at all, but to serve him wholeheartedly as he served them. Are you prepared to serve wholeheartedly the Christ who has served you 
by taking the path of the cross. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we come in much weakness and confess our hearts so often do not have a servant attitude, but rather we like the place where we can tell others what to do, where we are looking down upon others. Our passion is so often worldly. Forgive us, O God, and lift up the light of your countenance upon us. Grant us your grace, O Lord, that we might be true servants, that we would learn, even from this passage, the path of service is to follow Jesus Christ. What a path he trod. Lord, we pray that the place of our following would be in the humble service of our Savior and Master and Lord, wherever he leads us. Go before us, enable us, Lord, through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to conclude as we sing from Psalm 72, stanzas 5 to 9. This is the psalm of the king, of course, the servant king, and we're singing stand, stanzas 5 to 9. Psalm 72 at stanza 5. May just men flourish in his days, and may there be true peace, which will abound through ages all, until the moon will cease. And how will we have peace? Well, when people begin to serve as they should, that brings about a peace. Everybody wants to do what is right and pleasing to God, and then... The kings will bow down. Nations, too, will come to serve the Lord, and he will care for the needy and the weak. Psalm 72, 5 to 9, the tune of St. Lawrence, 1, 4, 8. Let us praise God together. May just men flourish in his days, and may blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with God's people now and always. Amen. <clears throat>